All right, everyone, we're going to go ahead and get underway in the interest of time as we've got a lot to cover today. Welcome to Promoting Equity, Lived Experience, Housing First, and System Performance. What matters in the FY 2023 NOFO? All right, sorry about that little glitch there. So um, the team is going to introduce themselves. I'll actually kick us off first. My name is Mary Frances Kenyon. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm the Vice President of Training and Technical Assistance at the Alliance. I am based in Southern Maryland, but currently at our DC office. Josh? Hey, y'all. Good morning, good afternoon, depending on where you call it from. Josh Johnson, Senior Technical Assistance Specialist. I go by he, him, his pronouns, identify as Black African American. I am calling uh, out of Columbus, Ohio, uh, but I'm excited to be here and seeing so many, so many uh, folks in the chat, uh, but I'll pass it to uh, Kay. Good morning for most of you. Good afternoon for our East Coast folks. Um, happy to be here. Kay Mosher McDivitt. I'm a senior technical assistant specialist on um, in our center for capacity building, and I am out of Florida at this time. All right, uh, and I'll wrap this up. Uh, Marcy Thompson, I'm the vice president for programs and policy. Uh, I uh, use she, her pronouns, and I am located uh, down in Southern Maryland and working from home today. Excited to be here with all of you. Ooh, ooh. All right. So um, for our today's agenda, we've got five sort of broad areas that we're going to cover. We're going to talk a little bit about the existing HUD policy priorities around homelessness, as well as some key changes. I already see some Q&As uh, inquiring about those key changes. So stay tuned and we'll get your questions answered live momentarily. Uh, we really want to spend a bit of time talking about how you can take the NOFO process from transactional to transformational. It shouldn't just be a check in the box exercise where you maximize points. This is a way to drive system performance throughout your COC and across those COC funded projects. Um, then we'll spend some time talking about some of the strategic considerations to really end homelessness. Uh, after that, we will talk about seizing the opportunity and diving into what scoring really means uh, and how you can leverage the scoring rubric to really make some of those transformational changes in your systems. Uh, and finally, we will have uh, just a bit of time dedicated to talking about some resources that you have at your fingertips uh, across each of the domains that we'll cover today. And then we will wrap up. So before we get underway, we do have some statements for participation. Um, this is for each of our webinars. Uh, the Alliance works to ensure that diverse voices are included as speakers, attendees, and guests at our conferences and webinars. All voices are welcome. We also have a zero tolerance policy for any form of discrimination or abusive behavior. Uh, we are committed to ensuring that all of our events are safe and respectful for all participants, so please keep that in mind as you might be using the chat and Q&A. Uh, we ask that you acknowledge that any form of discrimination, violence, or abusive behavior may result in removal from this webinar, depending on the situation. Uh, Conversely, if any discrimination is witnessed or experienced during this webinar, or if you feel unsafe, please, please notify any member of the Alliance staff. Lastly, the National Alliance to End Homelessness strives to create a diverse, inclusive, accepting, and safe space for everyone. Just a few housekeeping notes. Um, everyone who's an attendee uh, on today's webinar is muted, but please feel free to make use of the chat box to engage with one another, share information and ideas, and talk to your colleagues from all throughout the country. As a gentle reminder, and I'm excited about this, we are not HUD. We are not HUD. And this one and the one below me, no longer had TA providers. Um, so with that in mind, if you have NOFO specific questions, uh, you definitely need to reach out to the COC NOFO uh, email address that's located on the screen. And last but not least, this webinar is recorded. Um, so keep that in mind as well. 
All right, so we're going to get rolling. Um, I'm excited to be turning it over to my colleague, uh, Marcy Thompson, uh, with the $3.134 billion in funding that was made available, uh, representing an almost 11% increase over FY 2022 funding. Um, Marcy is going to get to kick us off with uh, aligning around HUD priorities and some of those key changes. Marcy? All right, thank you, Mary Francis. Uh, so as uh, Mary Francis said, I'm gonna spend uh, just a little bit of time this morning talking about some of the key strategies uh, that were, are included in this year's NOFO, as well as reviewing key changes uh, that, uh, that you should be aware of. Uh, next slide, please. All right, all right. Uh, so HUD uh, has a strategic plan uh, and that strategic plan sets the direction and focus of its programs and staff of create strong, sustainable, inclusive communities with access uh, to quality, affordable housing for everyone. The COC program NOFO advances the goals within HUD's strategic plan, emphasizing two overarching priorities focused on increasing equity and improving the customer experience. Next slide. Uh, and so each year, HUD establishes clear policy priorities that are reflected uh, in the selection criteria of the NOFO to support the goal of ending homelessness. I'm going to spend a few minutes talking through each of the policy priorities for this year. So first up is ending homelessness for all persons. Uh, in late 2022, the U.S. NRHC Council on Homelessness or USICH released all in the federal strategic plan to prevent and end homelessness. I think uh, my colleague Josh is gonna pop that in the chat. Um, and that plan is really built around six pillars that are designed to prevent and end homelessness across all population. Uh, and it's uh, has three foundational pillars that are equity, evidence uh, and collaboration and three solution focused pillars, which are housing and supports, uh, homelessness response and prevention. This NOFA reflects and is supportive of the actions and strategies across each of the six pillars, and COCs are encouraged to develop local plans that are reflective of the strategies that are laid out in the federal plan and use qualitative and quantitative data to inform those local planning efforts, ensuring that the housing and supportive services being made available within your community are tailored to your community's specific needs and preferences. Uh, using a housing first approach, uh, as a reminder, housing first is an approach to ending homelessness that prioritizes providing permanent housing to people experiencing homelessness without any preconditions as quickly as possible and connecting them to voluntary services and supports necessary to sustain that housing. COC program funded projects are encouraged to utilize this evidence-based and client-centered approach to quickly move people into housing while ensuring that they have access to the types of supports and services that they want and need once they are housed. Because as we all know, housing first is not housing only. Uh, we also know that saying housing first or saying that you're using a housing first approach uh, and actually implementing it with fidelity are not always the same thing. So COCs are encouraged to regularly assess uh, how uh, Housing First is really being implemented in your area. Uh, reducing unsheltered homelessness. In recent years, the number of people experiencing unsheltered homelessness has risen significantly, including a rising number of encampments in many communities. Moving people from unsheltered locations into permanent housing using a housing first approach should be a top priority. Uh, and you should be working with uh, local and state governments as well as local law enforcement agencies to educate and advocate against any laws and practices that criminalize homelessness. Uh, improving system performance. Uh, the COC system performance measures are the best tool to determine how effectively you're, uh, you're serving people experiencing homelessness within your community. While working to improve the outcomes measured in your system performance, you should also be using your coordinated entry processes to promote participant choice, coordinate homeless assistance and mainstream housing and services uh, to ensure that people experiencing homelessness receive assistance quickly and to make sure that homeless, uh, homelessness assistance is open, transparent, and inclusive. 
And building off of this, there is an even greater emphasis this year on partnering with housing, health, and service agencies. DOC should be utilizing cost performance and outcome data to improve how all available resources within your community are being utilized to end homelessness. Uh, you should be pursuing partnerships with public and private healthcare organizations to ensure that program participants have access to the healthcare services that they want and need. And this should include services that address behavioral health conditions and or substance use disorders. You should partner with your uh, public housing agencies and state and local housing organizations to expand affordable housing opportunities for people experiencing homelessness. Um, and because we know that so many people experiencing homelessness want to work or want better employment opportunities, you're encouraged to partner with local workforce development centers to improve employment opportunities. Uh, and finally, if you happen to be uh, in a COC that borders a tribal area, making sure that you are working with tribal organizations in your community to ensure that tribal members can access COC funded assistance. Uh, racial equity is next. Uh, in nearly every community, Black, Indigenous, and other people of color are substantially overrepresented in the homeless population. Our responses to preventing and ending homelessness must address racial inequities to ensure successful outcomes for all persons experienced in homelessness. Partnering with a racially diverse set of stakeholders that is inclusive of people uh, who are experiencing homelessness and who have a history of experiencing homelessness in a process to review any local plans, policies, and practices in order to identify barriers that result in racial disparities and perpetuate systemic racism is a good place to start, but it doesn't end there. This work is ongoing, it is hard, but it is necessary. Uh, and the pursuit of racial justice and equity requires us to change the way that we do business. Uh, improving assistance to LGBTQ plus individuals. Uh, COCs and project applicants must ensure that they are creating safe spaces for all program participants, which requires special and thoughtful consideration to ensure that the needs of LGBTQ plus transgender, gender non-conforming, and non-binary individuals uh, and families are met. Consider partnering with organizations with expertise in serving LGBTQ plus populations to ensure that all projects within your community are ensuring that privacy, respect, safety, and access are, are all there, uh, regardless of gender identity or sexual orientation. Uh, persons with lived experience, uh, the people who know the best solutions uh, to what will effectively end homelessness are those who have and who are experiencing homelessness. Therefore, it is critical that you have people with lived expertise involved in all steps of planning and policy development. One-off opportunities to provide input such as focus groups are, are really just not sufficient. Ensure that people with lived expertise are at all tables, be transparent as possible, and build up a collaborative relationship with individuals with lived expertise while allowing their views or experiences to be at the forefront of the process. Uh, and then the last one is increasing affordable housing supply. Uh, the lack of affordable housing continues to be the main driver of homelessness, and we all must make the case to our local leaders and stakeholders about the importance of increasing the, the supply of affordable and accessible housing. Uh, this NOFO is incentivizing COCs around the level in which you're proactively engaging local leaders about increasing affordable housing and supply. All right, next up, I'm gonna chat about uh, key changes for FY 2023, starting with of uh, the uh, $147 million that is available for uh, uh, youth Homelessness Demonstration Program funding. Uh, the Consolidated Appropriations Act of 2023 gave HUD the ability to use COC program funding to competitively or non-competitively renew or replace grants. In the FY 2023 COC program NOFO, HUD will competitively renew or replace projects that were initially funded in round one of YHGP funding. Projects that were awarded in round two or later can be renewed or replaced non-competitively. 
but will still be reviewed for compliance with the project eligibility, project quality, and if applicable, project renewal thresholds. YHC applicants, all YHCP uh, project applicants may still integrate YHCP special activities into the project design uh, of their uh, project application. There is also $52 million available to create new projects that are dedicated to survivors of domestic violence, dating violence, sexual assault, or stalking who qualify under the definition of homelessness, uh, under category four of the definition of homelessness. Uh, it is important to note that while survivors of human trafficking may qualify as homeless based on category four of the homeless definition, because they're also often victims of domestic violence, dating violence, sexual assault, or stalking, um, a DV bonus project may not exclusively serve people fleeing or attempting to flee human trafficking. COCs are generally eligible to apply for up to 10% of their preliminary parata need. However, there is a minimum award amount of $50,000 and a cap of $5 million. Next slide, please. Um, so I just mentioned category four of the homeless definition and want to make sure that we highlight uh, some critical changes to this part of the of the homeless definition. Section 605 of the 2022 reauthorization of the Violence Against Women Act amended Section 103B of the McKinney-Vento Homeless Assistance Act to modify paragraph four or category four is what we normally refer to it as of the homeless definition. I'm not gonna read it out loud, but please note that the bolded words on the slide uh, are the changes from the original definition. The statutory change took place, or took effect rather on October 1st, 2022. However, because HUD still needs to engage in rulemaking, the uh, COCs and recipients are not uh, yet required to make corresponding changes to uh, written standards and policies. However, because HUD is uh, required to still recognize as homeless those families and individuals who meet this new statutory criteria, DOCs may want to go ahead and start updating relevant rent standards and policies uh, sooner than waiting for when rulemaking occurs. Next slide. Uh, new this year, COCs may now request a higher amount for COC planning costs uh, than what is allowable in the interim rule. The new alternative maximum under this NOFO is the greater of $50,000 of 50, or 5% of the applicable final pro rata need, provided that the total grant amount for COC planning activities does not exceed $1.5 million. Um, and lastly, there are some new eligible budget activities that can be included as budget line items. These include costs associated with facilitating and coordinating activities to ensure compliance with VAWA emergency transfer plan requirements and monitoring compliance with confidentiality protections, uh, and also activities that address barriers to transitioning families in rural areas to permanent housing, um, and additional activities aimed at increase in capacity in order to address the unique challenges that COCs face when serving people experiencing homelessness in rural communities. Applicants that wish to utilize these new budget line item, new budget line items can request a budget modification during the competition to add funds uh, to, to the, these new line items from an existing line item. Um, applicants may also request it to create an expansion project uh, to add new funding for these newly allowed costs. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and finally, uh, in FY23, HUD continues to use a tiering process for funding. This year, tier one is equal to 93% of a COC's annual renewal demand. Note that the annual renewal demand, or ARD, does not include the annual renewal amounts of YHGP, YHGP projects that were initially awarded in YHGP round two or later. Tier two is equal to the difference between tier one and then the maximum amount of renewal reallocation round one YHGP funding and COC bonus funds for which a COC can apply. Um, this uh, tier two also does not include YHGP projects that were funded in round two or later, because again, those are uh, can be awarded non-competitively. 
Uh, all right, I am now gonna turn it over to the fabulous Kay Mosher McDivitt. Thank you. Hey, you are muted. Hey, you're muted. <laughs> Okay, y'all can hear me now, right? Good to go. Okay, so um, I'll just quickly slip back here. So we're just gonna talk, um, I think one of the things that, uh, just so y'all know, I've had, I've been where you, most of you are. Um, Mary Frances is also, we have, you know, in, in our former lives um, written um, applications for the, what we used to call the NOFA, now the NOFO. So, um, totally understanding sort of how this time of year feels and the, you know, the extra work and the stress. So just wanting to let you know that, that we will. And so our whole point in doing this is how can we help you and make this, you know, easier for you or give you any little um, tidbits of stuff that may just help you submit, a, you know, the best application possible. And I think one of the things is that a lot of times um, we know that there are some continuums that will like really look at all the details and, and really think about this word transactional, like are we answering all these questions? But what we want you to be doing is thinking about this beyond crossing the T's and dotting the I's, which you need to do, obviously. But how are you going to use this opportunity in your community to transform what you're doing around ending homelessness? Marcy went over the, the, the nine priorities, and but looking at those priorities. And so what I'm going to talk about in the next few minutes here, more, more than a few minutes of, of the next few slides, is how you start stepping back from all the detail because sometimes we get so wrapped up in the details of the HUD requirements that we forget that this is really a funding opportunity to end homelessness specific to what we need in our community. So I'm going to talk about that. And so here's what, you know, as, as I thought about this, and if you've been on a webinar in the last two years, I've used a very similar slide to say, it's super important to sort of do these three things before you get started. And yes, I know there's these timelines in terms of things we need to do, but when you start, you know, putting information into the actual application and when you start creating or updating your tools for scoring and when you start scoring your projects and projects that are coming in, you know, when you're putting your applications together, I want you to first stop and do some reflection, re reflection, like really ask yourself some questions about, you know, what is our project doing if I'm a project applicant to further the goals of ending homelessness in our community? Um, and as the consumer care leads, as your governance boards, like, what do we need? Do we have the right stuff? Is this a time for reallocation? When we look at new projects, are we funding the right stuff to make sure that we're going to meet not only the priorities, but the ultimate goal of reducing homelessness? So first, you start just reflecting, looking at some stuff. I'll go over that. And then review, like starting to look at your data, um, look at system data, look at uh, project data and really think about are these things happening and then there is the reading up right that's all the details of really understanding the NOFO reading um, through all of the materials so that that helps you with all the technical aspects of doing a good submission so setting the stage so here's where I really want you to think about first of all if you have not pulled out you know, I'm assuming you did it when it first came, but you should be pulling out your 2022 debrief and look at your debrief. Where did you score well? What are you doing well? But also not only the debrief, but you should have that application in front of you and be reflecting on what did I write last year, right? What is here? Um, what did we say that we were going to do? Um, and did we do that? Am I going to be able to talk about in this? So who, you know, whether it's you writing it, um, you know, 
from the local consumer care or you're hiring a consultant, like really be reflecting on what we said we were going to do and have we done that and be ready to talk about that. Like what's that information and progress we've made towards our stated goals that we have that. Where did you not receive the maximum points? Specifically, where didn't you? And be ready to address that, you know, in your application you know, here's an area that we did not do as well on. This is what we're doing. We're going to fund these projects. Um, and this is what we're expecting. Or this is other things that we're doing in our continuum to, to do better in this area. And then really prioritize and plan to address your areas. Prioritize those areas that you have not done as well in. I actually, if, if I'd be y'all, I might even go back to my 2021 debrief, right? Um, and it, it because if you're not strategic about how you think about this and you just go into this sort of like, okay, this is what it's saying I need to do. Um, I'm answering these questions. I'm following, you know, the technical you know, submission things that I need to do, but you're not thinking about your system as a whole and how you're going to use this to transform your system and really meet the goals of reducing homelessness and increase your, your um, system measures of performance, you're losing an opportunity to really help the folks in your community um, that are experiencing homelessness. And then, and this last one that's on here, really also thinking about this, like what projects can help you perform, uh, improve performance. And, you know, I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit more about that, but I, this is super important. I think there's a lot of times, and I was one of those too, is like, you know, you had a project that was coming in. It was, you know, as a community, we liked the project. And so it was sort of like, oh, renewal, check, we're good. But, you know, there's a lot of things that, that HUD is asking for and start to really zero in. And is this project, maybe it's what we needed 10 years ago. You know, and so one example would be like we have a lot of rapid housing for families and, you know, maybe 10 years ago that was our focus, but maybe what we really need now is more rapid housing for individuals and should we be looking at reallocation, should we be looking at instead of funding all of this, what we really need because the majority of our people experiencing unsheltered homelessness are single adults on um, the majority of the people in our shelters are single adults and so what we really need are services for single adults and, you know, and can we better utilize our, our resources to do that? So make, this is not easy, right? None of this is easy, but it's really not about what makes it easy for us. And I always say that, you know, the NOFO um, experience is not about making friends necessarily um, with all the providers. This is one of those times that I'm just encouraging you to step back and say, this is about ending homelessness and think about each of those persons in your community experiencing homelessness. And are we doing our best effort? Are we making our best effort at being strategic to be transformational within our system? And then the other one is just really talking, right? We, so these are things that we've had up for the last two years. So this is year number three. Um, and this is some of the, the um, goals that we came out with when all of the, you know, the money was coming out during the pandemic and the COVID relief dollars were coming out is that we were saying to communities, be really strategic again about how you use these resources. So right here is like a list of eight things to do and really be reflecting like, how are you doing at embedding people with current current and recent lived experience into all aspects? Like not just while you're doing the NOFO, but what have we done throughout the year? Um, what are our projects doing throughout the year? What are we really doing around this? Being really urgent in everything you do, but also making sure that you're equitable. Obviously, if it makes it easier, um, you know, sometimes being urgent um, and, and doing something quickly is like, well, let's just keep doing this, you know, with the, the, the programs we have and the resources we have because we can do it quickly. But then we may not be equitable because we're not thinking beyond what we've done in the past. And if it's, it's led us to an equity and equality, we have to really address that and disparities, right? Housing first principles and practices, we can't say enough about that. This is not a checkbox. This is not a checkbox. Can I say that again? This is not a checkbox that somebody on, um, you know, an application or in a submission checks, are you housing first? Yes or no. It really means some due diligence on the part of the rank and review committee to look at policies and procedures, um, ask for specific materials that 
really shows that this is a project aligned with Housing First. Um, and then again, helping people with the highest needs. We want to reduce the number of people experiencing literal homelessness. So what are we going to do about that? Already talked about the racial disproportionality and disparities. And then the working partnerships. So this is not partnerships on paper. Um, and Marcy already talked about this earlier, about there's an increased you know, effort. I'm really looking at the, the housing um, and, and healthcare partnerships, but these are working partnerships. What does that mean? What can we do? What did we say we were gonna do last year? Because by the way, this was in there. What did we say we we're gonna do and did that happen? And if it didn't happen, what can we be doing? Um, I always say that, you know, what you don't do is after you push the submit button is just like go, okay, now I'm, I've am i submitted this and now I'm, we're back to business as usual. It's literally like, okay, we push a submit button, but like every time, you know, a committee or our governance is getting together, we need to be really looking at what we said we were going to do, what we need to get accomplished in this next year based on what we submitted so that next year we are in a better place um, that we can show that literally everything we, we said we were going to do and we're striving to do is reducing homelessness. And then again, collaboration, um, looking at older adults, tribal entities, the VA, and any others that are providing services, making sure, again, these are working collaborations and not just on paper. So be reflective of this as you start this work. And so here's your milestone, right? Next thing is that being strategic is reviewing your data, right? So if we if we want to hit this milestone that homelessness is rare, brief, and one time, we need to really have an intense focus on housing people as quickly as possible. So that comes back to what I just talked about is having that housing first approach. If you have a systemic housing first approach in your system and every provider is housing first focused, right? Um, and, and they're not putting up barriers to services. You're going to find that you can, you should see increased access to permanent housing. You should see decreased lengths of stay. And yes, there's barriers, right? We know that housing, you know, affordable housing is a huge issue. But in spite of that, we know communities that are really embedding housing first across their system are still finding ways and creative strategies to house people quickly and be a housing first approach, right? And so really consistently looking at that housing first approach in everything that you do and then providing those services once people are housing. One of the things I'm gonna say that we're seeing and one of the things to be really critical, I encourage you when you're really reviewing um, renewal projects or even new, new projects is that we are hearing from a lot of communities that providers, I think, you know, during COVID, coming out of COVID and then having the, the emergency housing crisis that we have, you know, the, the emergency that affordable housing crisis has, has created in our communities is we're hearing that, that there's a lot more resistance um, to um, housing people quickly first and then doing the services, providing the services to get people ready to be stabilized, right? That there's a lot more barriers we're hearing from shelters in some communities that we've been in that the, the Raptor housing people are saying, don't refer anybody to us until they have a job. Um, don't refer anybody to us until they've done A, B, C, and D. And rapid rehousing is literally, that. there's a reason it's called rapid rehousing is that you're supposed to be housing people rapidly. And just because you have funding called rapid rehousing, really look at your providers and look at how quickly are they housing people? What parameters are they putting up? Because that is going to, all of that's going to interfere with meeting this milestone of making homelessness brief um, and getting people into housing. So couple of things to come up here is that, of course, those are out of buy. So you want to really use lived expertise and equity as a foundation for all of this. So as you're looking at your data, looking at the projects, looking at what you have is that, you know, what is happening with folks in a housing crisis, right? Are people having a safe place to go? What is happening on the, on the unsheltered side? What does our data show us? What is our data showing us about how long people are um, spending homeless? And if we're seeing those lengths of time go up, then let's just, and we know that there's you know, external factors in that, but let's also look at all of the internal things. 
are projects changing the way they're doing things? Uh, maybe there's one or two projects that have really seen a dramatic increase in the amount of time it's taking to house people where other projects have not seen that as much. So start having conversations. Um, do we need to reallocate money from a higher performing um, program or project to a, um, or from a lower performing project to a higher performing project? Just mix those up, right? So really be thinking about that. And then again, what's happening with um, people exiting um, you know, into homelessness and are they coming back quickly? And, and some of the things that we're also hearing is that, you know, during the pandemic, we had a lot of dollars. And so um, that projects were sometimes, you know, again, using rapid housing example, um, because there was a lot of money to rapid housing with and people were being housed very quickly, right? And then because we had the money to spend and there was a, a lot of effort to spend down the resources is that sometimes people were housed in housing they couldn't afford right, that they would probably never afford. They were given two years worth of assistance. There was not enough work done around stabilization. And now at the end of it, now those folks are falling back into homelessness. So step back, look at what's happened with that. Are those the providers that we're gonna keep funding or are we gonna make some changes on doing all that? So really review your data. What is your data telling you? And by the way, HUD is gonna be pulling the data that you submitted on the HDX and the system performance measurements. And so it's not like you can change your data, that data's in there. And, and when they come to looking at your performance, they're gonna use that data. So if your performance measures, you know, you've, you've shown increases, um, and unsheltered and increases in length of time and decreases in exits and increases in returns to homelessness. You need to be ready to address those both in your narrative and in the projects that you're um, funding. And then again, just making sure that your application and your funded projects are including all of this. And let me say this right here. You're, and I think I have this one other place, but if you if your um, rank and review tool does not have anything about how projects are including people with lived expertise um, in their decision-making processes, um, looking at how your know, staffing is happening, if you're not having them address racial disparities and talk about that and giving you data about what's happening on that, if that's not part of your rank and review, I would suggest you need to get it in there and put a lot of points to that because Marcy already talked about that. That's part of what the priorities are for HUD, and it's part of the scoring. There's a lot of points in the scoring on that. So you need to be really um, proactive about what you're doing. And just because you used a tool before, remember, you're getting rated on those tools, right? You get points if your tool is a good tool or not. And so don't use something just because you used it before. Your tool should align with the priorities that Marcy went over and make sure that your projects are aligned with those. And then the read, right? And so I think, you know, Marcy already talked about this, like just understand all of this. I said this, use these priorities to talk about what your community has, what's working, what's not working, what you need to do to fill the goals, right? Um, and then really focus on system and project performance, right? So making sure that the performance um, project performance is also reflected in your systemic performance, right? Project performance should align with your systemic performance. And then just really also be thinking about the training and technical assistance for projects and be able to talk about that if in fact somebody is not there. So, I mean, we say, we suggest talking about reallocation really early on and letting people know you're doing that. We know that we're about, mm, what, five weeks now into the release of the NOFO four weeks and some days. Um, and so I know we're only telling you this now, but, you know, pull these slides out this recording next year, the minute the NOFO hits, because we'll probably tell you the same thing next year is that letting your, your community know is that reallocation is one of the things and the things that we're going to be doing to make sure that we're funding the right things. It should not come as a surprise to folks. Hey, Kay, yeah. can you make sure you let me know when the slides need to be advanced? There's a lag. Okay, so you're, so I'm advancing them. No, I don't, I can stop sharing so you can share if that helps. Oh, so I'm, already, the lag. I'm sorry, I'm already in the share. I have the share screen up. All right, there you go. Thanks. Sorry about that, folks. All right. Um, and then the details, and I know you all waited and waited and waited for the detailed instructions. I hope you all know that they are out. 
Um, they, they announced it earlier this week. I actually went into the homeless hub on Facebook and like said, they're out. I think other people were saying the same thing. So make sure you like literally read those and, and, and be able to address everything that's in there. Even if you don't, you know, even if it's like, oh, I don't know that we're doing this, address it. Like, okay, we're not doing this now, but this is what we're doing. And this is, this is what the projects that we're going to fund. This is how it's going to help us get there. You need to make a connection with your projects, right? And your application. There should be a clear connection between what you're funding and what your application says your community is doing. And then finally, I already said this, that your data is going to be used to review the application for performance. Um, and Mary Frances is going to talk about that. Is that, you know, huge, um, a huge um, effort on, uh, that's probably not the one word I wanted to use. I'm probably having one of those moments, but there's an emphasis. There's a huge emphasis, again, on performance this year. Last year, it went way up and it's still up there. Um, so really knowing you can't go back and change the performance because they already have all of that information, but you need to be able to talk about that and talk about how your projects are going to improve that performance. So always start with the end in mind, right? So with everything you fund, don't start with the projects that we already have. Oh, well, we already have this and we're going to renew. And then we have these new projects coming in. Even when you ask for new projects, you know, be really strategic. Like, you know, just because something's eligible to be funded doesn't mean that's what your community needs. And so, yes, you can get new permanent housing projects this year. But instead of just saying, oh, we're accepting, you know, applications for permanent housing projects for PSH, rapid rehousing, DV bonus, be really specific about exactly what does your community need, right? And ask for projects that are going to meet an unmet need in your community. Again, we're seeing a lot of communities that still don't have hardly any rapid housing for single individuals. And, and that's going to count against you, right? So instead of funding, you know, and then somebody says, well, we didn't get any projects, you know, submitted to do rapid housing for singles. But you as leadership need to put out that ask. If you're the continuum of care governance and you're listening to this, you need to put out that ask and say, this is what we need. And, and then the other thing is even starting with the end in mind, if we're looking at racial equity, right? Like, let's get in contact with some grassroots organizations that are embedded in communities with, you know, people of color. If, if in fact we have a lot more black people in our, in our um, system that are experiencing homelessness than our region, where do those get services? What, you know, where are those grassroots organizations that can really quickly connect with folks in their communities and bring in other folks to the table and really be strategic in that and really thinking about does our system flow well? Right. So this is a traffic circle. Um, I think I mentioned that I'm down here in Florida and um, in saying that that um, we have a lot of traffic circles where I am and traffic circles by like what studies show is that traffic circles actually decrease the amount of accidents and increase traffic flow, like keeps people moving, keeps the speed going is way better for traffic in communities even though people as they approach traffic circles and aren't comfortable with them can go, ooh, right? Well, during the season when people come down here to get away from cold weather and they come around here, these traffic circles outside of season, traffic just moves in our traffic circles. And it really is a flow. I mean, you know, because people aren't stopping, they're gradually approaching, they know how to get in and fit in, they know how to look for the cars, people are coming in and out, and it's just like clockwork. But then you have folks that come in and don't know what's going on, and they put the brakes on, right? And now the whole traffic circle gets to be a hot mess, or there's an accident. So thinking about, are you a good traffic circle or is there one or two projects like the cars that are holding up the flow of the traffic circle? And, and if you're funding those projects, what is that? Is there something we can do to get those projects better? Um, or do we need to rethink those projects and really bring on something and bring on another car that's gonna understand getting in that traffic circle better? Because remember that you want to make sure that everything you're funding is going to have an impact on positive flow. And not only what we currently are funding, but what new projects would increase that flow. And then I want you to also, again, be in reflecting on really looking at 
what's going to meet the needs of the people experiencing homelessness and the priorities. I knew I had this on the slide, so I'm not going to talk about this. You can see this. Here's the specific things I already talked about when I was talking about being strategic and reflecting earlier. This was more your nuts and bolts slide, so you have this. But here's the specific bullets. You know, again, I do not use the same rank and review tool you used last year without reviewing it and aligning it with the priorities. Make sure that. And I be, see the second bullet under that one, be sure. And that's capital S-U-R-E, that your projects are partnering with people with lived expertise and they're addressing racial inequities and their practice is completely embedded in housing first. Those three things have to be huge, right? And, and I've seen already um, tools that will talk about exits, you know, to homelessness, right? Like, you know, what is the exits of homelessness? But it's not just the number of exits, is you also should be looking at lengths of stay, right? Like how long is it taking people to exit somebody to, to homelessness? Um, you know, if you're funding a transitional housing project, for example, we, you know, through the, the joint component, or you still have, you know, one from um, just a regular transitional housing project, you know, they may have a really high amount of access to permanent housing, but the length of time that people are there might be, you know, 400 days, 600 days, right? Um, and so that is, that is adding to that length of stay for your entire system and they're not serving as many people. So you need to look at all of that, right? Not just one thing, you need to look at all of it. And I've already said all of this, right? This slide, if you don't remember anything else what I said, this one, go to the slide. It's gonna be slide 23 when we publish the slides. Oh, and I put that up later, forgot that was on here. Again, I said this, but I'm going to say it again. Just because it's an eligible activity doesn't mean it's a priority for your community. Like really making sure of that. And then again, um, look at your um, objective criteria. Um, I think we've talked about this. This is some of the things, but also, you know, your performance benchmarks. I hope that each of you are setting performance benchmarks for all of your projects, like for all of our rapid housing projects. These are our community benchmarks that we expect you to meet. Um, um, are there actual steps that, you know, maybe there was a project that last year you identified they weren't addressing racial inequities in their, their um project and now we have to take a look and see if that's improved like really be thinking about that and just a little bit more advice right so I think Marcy already talked about this um she said you know it's not just enough to put together you know sort of you know one person on the board to really be strategic you really partnering partnering with people and um, Josh, I think the word is integrating. We would like to even go beyond partnering and say integrating people with lived experience, right? How are we integrating people across our entire continuum? Um, are they are they involved in the review committees, right? Are they involved in reviewing the scoring tool? And and it's also not just about the this time, like all through the year. How are you embedding people with lived experience in all of the work that you do and having them be part of the decision-making process? And on your governance committee, that doesn't mean having one person. I, I encourage you to have several people because how hard would it be for one person with lived experience to come onto a board? And we're talking all these acronyms and all the stuff that we do. And it feels, it's very intimidating. It was intimidating for me when I first joined the governing board when I was in the homeless system and I'm a service provider. And I'm like, I have no idea what you folks are talking about. So really be thinking about how you're doing that and being very purposeful in using those voices. And this is recent experience. You know, I know I'm taking that, you know, we would always say, oh, we have people with lived experience, you know, um, but, it, you know, the person we had had, you know, as a child experienced homelessness and, you know, and now they're in their 40s, right? So we checked the box and this is way more than that. So make sure that it's really embedded in everything you do, that our folks that we're serving have, have a lot of um, influence in what we're doing. Address your racial disparity, your disparities, right? Again, what specific steps are you taking? as a continuum to promote racial equity. So, you know, we have a lot of tools that you can like pull down and say, oh, here's the inequities. And I hear a lot of people talking about, we have all these disparities, but what are you doing? 
What are you changing? What partnerships are you doing? What are you doing on the front end of really thinking about diversion or other things that you're doing? And even though HUD, these funds aren't going to fund your diversion, you should be talking about what you're doing on that side of diversion to really figure out like, are there, are we seeing certain communities that persons of color are falling into homelessness and how can we get services in those communities? What does your governance board look like? For example, if 35% of the people experiencing homelessness are, are black and brown people, then 35% of your governance board should be black and brown people. Um, also the projects that come in, the projects that are coming in, do they reflect the people you serve? Um, do they re reflect the racial demographics of who they're serving in the community? And making sure that you're ranking and rating projects based on what they're doing to address these. Maybe they're not there yet, but what are they doing to change that? And then finally, be strategic, right? That's how you end homelessness, right? Being transactional does not necessarily end homelessness, but using this NOFO to be transformational is going to be how you end homelessness. This is not business as usual. Yeah, I said this last year and I'm going to say it again, right? Don't do this because you're going to score better. Don't write things based on everything I've said because you score better, right? That's the icing on the cake. I really want you to think about doing this because it matters, right? This is the right thing to do for the folks experiencing homelessness in your community. And just like so quickly showing you, right? So you need to the right ingredients to make your cake. You need the right ingredients, right, to get your system flowing and have your system, the right projects. What do you have, right? And then you're going to have your system. Once you have the right ingredients, then you're going to have the cake. And getting a better score is just the icing, right? But if you don't have the right ingredients, then you don't have the right cake. And so the icing doesn't matter because it's not going to show a difference in any homelessness in your community. All right. I talked really fast. Um, so when you get the recording, you can slow it down and do the buzz. And I'm going to talk, turn it over to Mary Francis to talk about seizing the opportunity. Thank you, Kay. I'm waiting for my screen share to load. If you can go ahead and stop your screen share so we don't have any tech snafus. Perfect. All right, everyone, I am taking off, I guess, my official alliance hat, and I'm going to go back to my years as a direct service provider, um, but also as a COC lead, aka collaborative applicant. Um, so I'm, I'm not going to go through these next slides, reading them verbatim. Uh, I want to have a conversation with you based on my experience, both on the project applicant side of uh, uh, the, the NOFA, which used to be called the NOFA, um, for folks that are newer this year, which I think we have a few of, um, but also from actually leading a local competition, because um, I think those perspectives will be most helpful. So up on the screen, we've got some key deadlines, um, not going to read this verbatim, but of course, there are some really critical milestones within the local competition process, both for um, your COC collaborative applicant who's responsible for pulling everything together, uh, but also for project applicants that are either applying for new or renewal funding um, and also replacement funding for YHDP. So uh, all project applications must be submitted to the COC 30 days prior to the submission deadline. Um, and the submission deadline is down at the bottom, bolded there, Thursday, September 28th. Do not wait until Thursday, September 28th to submit your NOFO. You should give yourself a buffer um, of, of one to two days, uh, just in case there are any eSnaps issues, uh, any technical issues. And in the case of last year, any disasters. Um, we did have a number of COCs down in Florida that were impacted by uh, a, a natural disaster. And so pay close attention to those deadlines. Kay already talked about the importance of reading, not just through the NOFO um, itself, but also those detailed uh, instructions that accompany the NOFO. COC should be making sure that they let uh, project applicants know whether or not they're going to be accepted and ranked. Uh, that has to happen 15 days prior to the submission. Uh, and also there is that requirement that you post everything two days prior to the submission deadline. Um, what a fun process you will have in September. But you're going to get there. So um, COC coordination and engagement. I want to spend a little bit of time. This is our handy dandy uh, scoring chart comparison 
Um, one of the things, if you haven't guessed it by now, or if you're new to the NOFO writing process, the NOFO is really a, a points game, um, if you let it be a points game. And while it's really great to maximize the amount of points that you score on a NOFO, because that increases your chances of making sure that you're protecting your existing resources. So getting those renewal projects funded, um, potentially getting a new bonus projects funded and increasing uh, you know, the number of people that you're able to serve through the COC program funding, all of that is great, but this is not a check in the box exercise. If you are writing in your NOFO and saying that you have inclusive membership, you really have to have inclusive membership because it makes the decisions of the COC that much more rich. Um, you should actively be recruiting for new organizations and individuals and members of the community that might not be traditional homeless uh, service providers into the, the COC. Your um, invitation process for new members to join should be clearly communicated and transparent uh, as well. You want to make sure that, <clears throat> and I'm, again, not reading through all of this, but I do want to highlight some key points um, here. DV, um, for my DV, shout out to my DV providers that are on the call today. You as a COC have got to be partnering with uh, your, your local victim service providers or domestic violence providers. Um, they should be uh, voting members within your COC. You should be coordinating closely. Uh, you should be doing annual training. Annual training is not just enough. It's great to do training. It's great to have policies, but if you don't have the practice to align with those trainings and policies, um, you could end unintentionally cause harm to people experiencing homelessness that need to access services uh, in your COC. Same goes for addressing the needs of LGBTQ individuals. And you can see um, the weighting of the points here. Um, it's not just enough to have equal access annual training. This is not a check in the box exercise. You should make sure that you have ongoing training, but you should also be making sure, and I'm talking directly to um, program service providers, COCs that do monitoring, that in practice, you are adhering to the equal access rule, right? Um, additionally, the same way that domestic violence uh, or victim service providers or survivor service providers are um, or should be around the COC table. And when I say COC table, I'm talking about potentially your board, any of the committees. We should have these lenses represented across all of the subcommittees, committees, and boards that you have within your COC. Coordinating with public housing agencies, this is a big one. Um, and you can see how uh, many points are, are actually assigned to, to this. What does that even mean? Like, what does it mean to coordinate with a PHA? Um, if we go back to 2018, that was the year that um, it was a painful year for collaborative applicants and COCs because the mainstream vouchers application were released, which required COCs that were interested in pursuing that to really partner with public housing authorities um, to bring in new vouchers for non-elderly disabled individuals um, that were either at risk for or experiencing homelessness. Um, that was a very pivotal moment for me because I got real friendly with PHAs and I had, it, it was a whole different world for me, um, but in a good way. When we're saying coordinating with a public housing agency, what HUD is really saying is like, does your public housing uh, agency have maybe a preference for people experiencing homelessness? Are you lucky? Do you are you lucky enough to actually have a set aside of X number of vouchers that are dedicated to people experiencing homelessness or DV um, through the public housing authority? That is no easy feat. So I'm not going to make it sound like uh, it is because oftentimes some of the things that we want for people experiencing homelessness to be prioritized through the lens of a public housing agency means an administrative plan. And that's a really cumbersome process for uh, a PHA to go through. Uh, and I'm talking about the public housing authority specifically. So with that in mind, 
um, you should be linking to your public housing agencies, building relationships, and really advocating on behalf of people experiencing homelessness. I've seen a number of comments come up in the chat talking about how inaccessible vouchers are and how long the wait lists are. Marcy also dropped a, a new, newly um, shared resource, I think as of yesterday, uh, about some additional vouchers coming onto the street. Uh, we are seeing an, an unprecedented uh, investment in additional vouchers with additional flexibilities. Make sure you're connecting with your PHAs to um, take advantage of those on behalf of people experiencing homelessness in your communities. Um, housing first, I'm not going to dive too much into that. Um, your projects need to be housing first. When we say housing first, we're talking uh, no barriers to entry, income's not a requirement, employment's not a requirement, sobriety's not a requirement, we're not making up any arbitrary rules, um, and this is in practice, not in writing, not on your application. Um, I think Marcy and Kay both spoke to this. Uh, maintaining fidelity to Housing First is of the utmost importance. That's when it works. When you maintain fidelity, that's when it works. Um, All right, so next up, still in the realm of uh, COC coordination and engagement, um, let's see what we can focus on. Uh, Marcy, if we can get you to place that information about the new vouchers in the chat, that would be great. Perfect. We're twinning today, we're twinning. Um, so in terms of continuing on with uh, COC coordination and engagement, a couple of things here. Um, you are seeing a, about a relatively static change or lack thereof in terms of assignment of points. Um, where you did see the increase is around an effective uh, coordinated entry system and affirmatively furthering fair housing. We know that there was a, a rollback on affirmatively furthering fair housing um, that has changed. We're seeing a slight increase on uh, the point awarded to, to that coordinated entry piece and the addition of affirmatively furthering fair housing through coordinated entry. Um, but let's talk about some of those factors that uh, Kay was talking about. So promoting racial equity and the homelessness response. What even does that mean? Um, that means a whole lot of things. Uh, but in terms of coordination engagement, the basics, making sure that you reviewed your disaggregated data. Um, perhaps you have a working group or a subcommittee that is specifically tasked with helping to coordinate focus groups so that you can get some qualitative data from people with lived experience only if you're compensating them. Don't do focus groups if you're not planning on compensating people fairly and justly and equitably. Um, but to get a full picture uh, to support the data, right? So um, numerical data is great. However, it's an incomplete picture. You can't just roll with what you have based on quantitative data. You really need to understand from the people that are closest to your system, which is not service providers, it's not us as COC leads, it's not us as the Alliance, it is the people that are experiencing homelessness and who have navigated your system. They can tell you expeditiously what is wrong with your system and where the barriers are and why it is difficult for them to just get into permanent housing of their own that is safe and affordable. Um, so those are ways in which you can promote racial equity in your homelessness response. Also benchmarking your data. If you have disparities in your exits to permanent housing and you notice that one subpopulation over another seems to be getting access, Benchmark that data so that as you try new strategies to try and create more proportionate outcomes. Um, Mary Ellen, this is the slide that I'm showing. I think everyone can see it, COC coordination engagement. Um, if you are getting that fuller picture of information, um, that will paint a much clearer picture. But back to the data benchmarking, and let me close the chat because I get distracted easy, easily. Um, but as you benchmark that data, you know what progress or what milestones you need to set to reduce those dis disparities. So you should be actively working with your HMIS folks. You should be actively using your data um, not exclusively, but you should be actively using your data 
um, both the qualitative data and quantitative data to promote racial equity. You should be uh, establishing some baselines and you should be testing out some strategies based on the feedback from the very people who have experienced your system in a disparate way to inform how you move forward, what your strategies are, how to test them and how to refine them, and most importantly, whether or not you're successful in reducing those disparities. Uh, the other piece is, and HUD is really good about signaling to us. They're really good about saying, hey, we're gonna give this three points this year, and then we're gonna increase it by two. Um, we first saw the introduction of racial equity um, as something that was weighted with points in 2018. Um, HUD has been consistent in moving the weighting of those points uh, up even more each year. So 2018, 2019, uh, we didn't do 2020 for known reasons. Um, and then in, in subsequent NOFAs, it's either leveled off or, or remained at the, the level that it is. And they're signaling to you all um, as both on the COC collaborative applicant side, but also on the project side. And let me just remind you that COC funded projects are required to have representation of people with lived experience on your boards, um, unless you uh, somehow qualify for a waiver. And I don't think that that's the direction that we are uh, in support of. But you're seeing, it seems like just a two, per, two point increase today, um, but this is your signal, this is your notice to say, okay, we need to be involving individuals with lived experience of homelessness in service delivery, decision-making. And that doesn't just mean funding decisions during the NOFO time, that means policy decisions, that means implementation decisions, and providing professional development and employment opportunities. So those are all things uh, this is this is Mary Francis saying to you all today, pay close attention to this because this is your signal. Make sure you pick up on it now so that you can get working on it if it's not already in place. Um, and again, we're moving towards integration, that meaningful integration, not just partnership and certainly not tokenizing. Uh, Marcy talked uh, at, at good length about uh, coordinating and partnering with public health agencies. Um, don't just think about like, actual public health, think more broadly. Think about your local hospital system. Um, think about your local free clinics or your uh, federally qualified healthcare centers. You should be reaching out beyond the existing homeless services infrastructure, um, particularly for those communities that are not in more like urban city centers and don't necessarily have like street medicine programs make those partnerships. Um, it benefits not only you as a continuum, but also, and more importantly, people experiencing homelessness. Um, so I know that there was some chat about like rehab, new construction, there is a deduction that's static over last year's uh, competition. And, and that's really related to COCs that aren't completing questions for those new projects that include funding requests uh, around the, the new construction or rehab. So now I want to get into project uh, capacity, uh, review, and ranking, <clears throat> and um, we actually saw a little bit of a decrease, right? We actually saw a little bit of a decrease, and thank y'all for um, kind of talking about some best practices that you all are, are sharing in the chat there. Um, but like I said, we saw a decrease, um, particularly in the objective criteria to review project applications. That's a pretty big decrease over last year. Um, so that's a signal. Doesn't mean it's not important. You still have to run your uh, local competition. You have to, as a COC, develop your objective criteria to review these new projects. Um, you have to incorporate the use of system performance measures to review the applications for COC funding. Um, and I'm going to spend just a little bit of time talking about that one specifically. <clears throat> there was someone in the chat who, um, you know, asked, uh, how are we supposed to do all of this in 60 days? And I think Josh's response was, um, well, you're not. You're supposed to do this year round. And I'm gonna share my experience with going from a, a non-year round process to a year round process as a collaborative applicant um, at the urging of our consultant at the time that provided a ton of support uh, around our NOFO process and helped move us into this year round posture. Um, when you think about it, it, you know, you could wait until 
July, what was it, Wednesday, July 5th for HUD to drop the NOFO, or you could spend a little bit of time throughout the year to build on the activities that you're already uh, required to do by HUD uh, in preparation for the NOFO. So um, just in case you're wondering, HUD's policy priorities on homelessness, those nine priorities that Marcy covered in depth at the beginning of the webinar today, those weren't new priorities. Those were the exact same priorities as last year's NOFO. Um, and to be clear, I'm talking about the regular COC NOFO and not the SNOFO. Um, again, HUD likes to give us signals. So the, if those are the policy priorities year over year, those are the things that you wanna be focusing on in your system. Um, and one of the ways to do that is through system performance measures. Kay did a great job of covering how the system performance measures can um, help you transform your, your system. Um, but I wanna just spend a little bit more time diving into them. So for example, in our COC, one of the things that we did, and we weren't fancy enough or big enough to have like a, a dashboard and a tableau that I'm saying a lot of COCs have, shout out to y'all that have that infrastructure, but we had a good old fashioned Excel uh, report card and it was updated on a quarterly basis. And at all levels of the COC, we were reviewing that data. We were looking at the data um, to see how many people were exiting to permanent housing. Um, what was housing retention like? What was our recidivism looking like? And not just at the system level, but at the project level, right? When you are looking at your data in real time, assuming that you have really good data quality, that will let you know how your system performance is likely to, to fare out. In addition to that, um, we didn't just rely on the the numeric data or the quantitative data. Um, we were surveying participants across each of the projects on a quarterly basis. And we were understanding where we were doing well or where we weren't doing well, particularly in those permanent housing projects. Um, there was an issue that came up around limited English proficiency. We were failing. We had this beautiful policy in, in, in our you know, uh, coordinated entry policy document, but we weren't actually adhering to it. So that gave us a signal from people experiencing that had previously experienced homelessness, like, hey, we need to do a different language line because the current one we have is not meeting people where they are and it's impacting their housing stability. Um, additionally, uh, when you think about system performance, uh, you have some pretty key milestones every year, and they're usually around the same time. You've got your LSA due dates, and you've got your point in time and the housing inventory count. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that when we get to the actual system performance measure. Um, but conversations should be had. Uh, I'm hoping that folks have a data and performance management committee or a data and evaluation committee um, of folks throughout your provider base, people with lived experience that really get to do more of a deep dive into your data um, because your data really, really matters, particularly in the evaluation of um, project applications, whether new or renewals. Um, promoting racial equity when reviewing applications. Again, this is a signal. Um, that's a slight point increase, but a point increase nonetheless, uh, which brings our total to like 10 points around racial equity. Um, so how are you incorporating racial equity into your review process? Um, what are you doing with your priorities or review and ranking committee? How are you holding, uh, how are you supporting them and holding applicants accountable for what they are actually doing to address any racial disparities in their projects? Um, this, although it got a point decrease, I want to echo what Kay said around reallocation. Don't be afraid to reallocate. I have, as someone who has reallocated a project before, very uncomfortable, very necessary. Um, we had a project once upon a time that kept giving money back. They were chronic underspenders. So guess what? That's money lost. That means less people were able to serve in our permanent housing projects. We're gonna take a portion of your funding because you can't handle this amount and we're gonna give it to someone who's demonstrated that they can not only um, spend the amount, spend the amount on time, but also serve more people as a result, which helps us towards that goal of ending homelessness in uh, our COC. Mary, um, it's just, I don't know if we, if we wanna answer this or it's a hot question. Uh, speaking of reallocation, somebody did ask if there 
like if we're gonna if the plan is to reallocate a project it what do you do if people are housed in a project and you're going to reallocate money from that project to another like what do you do with the folks do you want to touch on that or should we just send that to hud um i will use my personal experience with doing that we actually didn't uh, we decided not to reallocate a project. We worked very closely with our field office for that specific reason, because we didn't want any disruption to the service delivery. Um, we had open and transparent conversations with uh, our COC about transitioning a grant for a smaller master leasing project from one grantee to another. Um, it was a very cumbersome uh, process with a lot of paperwork, a lot of changes in ELOCs uh, and very specific dates, but our field office was actually able to help us transition this uh, specific grant from one provider to another provider that had a demonstrated record of um, managing a leasing project for permanent supportive housing, um, specifically one that was a site-based uh, project. So, um, I think you have to weigh your options for us. Reallocation wasn't the solution because we weren't sure what we were going to get in the in the competition. And we knew that the project was being managed very poorly through a monitoring process that really uncovered some um, some things that were not up to snuff. And as a result, we we didn't wait on the COC program competition to reallocate. We, we had to do a, a grant transfer. Um, and yes, always ask HUD. Always, always ask HUD uh, what their official response is going to be. Thank you for that, Kay. That was sort of a non-answer, but that was a very practical, like this really happened answer. Um, so next up, HMIS and point in time count. We're, you know, we're seeing um, you know, a relatively the, the numbers are what they are here. Um, this is kind of check in the box exercise, like you have to submit these things on time. Um, so don't lose out points because you're not submitting things on time. Uh, making sure that your uh, DV or victim service providers have their own comparable database, um, make sure that they're adhering to confidentiality, which I know my DV advocates are. Um, they are the fiercest advocates around confidentiality and privacy that I know. Um, also submitting your LSA uh, in a timely manner. Make sure that you're working with the folks uh, with your HMIS team to make sure that that gets submitted. Like don't get docked for not submitting things on time. Um, every point literally matters. It could be the difference between losing a project, um, keeping your, your COC whole, or ideally getting new funding in so that you can help people experiencing homelessness, move out of homelessness and into housing. Uh, also, you know, conducting a point in time count and reporting it in the HDX. I saw there was a question earlier, like, is the HDX new? It's not new. Um, if you're new to the NOFA, HDX offers a competition report uh, that kind of gives a summary of all the things that you then have to put into uh, eSnaps. Uh, and then uh, also effective youth counts. Um, there are points for that, making sure that you are meeting the unique needs of counting, effective, effectively counting youth and young adults um, whose homelessness doesn't always present the way that it presents for families um, or even single uh, adults that are not in that young adult range. System performance, favorite part of today's conversation. These are your system performance measures. Uh, last year in 2022, we saw a huge increase uh, in the weighting of system performance. Uh, this year, we, we got one more point of an increase, but let's talk about it. Um, within your application, within your projects, you all are being um, weighted on how well and how effective you are at reducing the number of people experiencing homelessness as individuals and families. Um, so if you're doing that well, you get rewarded for it. If you're not doing that well, you're going to get penalized for it. Um, so I think some questions were coming up earlier. Quick example, uh, in interest of time, back to reallocation. If you have a transitional, and I'm, I'm not picking on a, a THRRH project, just naming one. If you have a THRRH project that's not 
reaching those outcomes and is kind of functioning like a separate transitional housing program and a separate rapid rehousing program with no connection, you might need to think about the efficacy of that as a solution in your system. Uh, and you might consider reallocating it based on the specific needs in your community. So if you have a need for permanent supportive housing, then you might think about making some changes there. If you have a need for rapid rehousing, you might need to think about making some changes there. Um, reducing the number of first time homelessness among individuals and families, there's three points for that. Um, the length of time, Kay said rare, brief, and one time. Um, that's a milestone in pursuit of, of housing justice. And the federal strategic plan talks about how we are, um, our federal partners are looking for a 25% reduction uh, in homelessness by 2025. We've had federal strategic plans before that have called for these great milestones. Make sure your strategies, um, your projects that you're funding is, are also reducing the length of time that people experience homelessness. Uh, demonstrating uh, and describing about how you can increase the rate which individuals are moving uh, and families are moving to permanent housing destinations or uh, continue to retain permanent housing. We want to eliminate um, housing instability and we want to make sure that folks are um, staying in their housing, both obtaining and staying in their housing. Recidivism is another piece, uh, making sure that People, once they experience homelessness and get into permanent housing, they don't have to come back into our systems again. That's not good for anyone. Um, increasing income for program participants, uh, both from employment and non-employment cash sources. This is, my, um, this is my moment to say this. If you all are not uh, within your COC, if you don't have anyone doing SOAR coordination or SOAR applications, please reach out to your state coordinator. This is a really great way, a uh, partnership through SAMHSA. Um, you can get certification to be SOAR certified. Um, the benefit to people experiencing homelessness, particularly older adults, particularly people with disabilities, is that SOAR certified case managers or SOAR certified uh, workers are able to help navigate the social security application process. Um, most communities that you know, use SOAR certified workers have really high success rates in getting people to that income that they needed. Think about it like this. We know that social security income is not a whole lot. It's like 800 bucks a month, but think about someone that has $0 in income a month and what the difference between zero to 800 can mean for them. I know we're all um, tired, we're fatigued coming out of COVID and just dealing with all of life's things. Uh, but if you are a collaborative applicant, please, please, please connect with your state level or your local SOAR coordinator, get your folks trained, get them invested. This is an opportunity to increase income for people experiencing homelessness uh, with a very high proven success rate. Uh, data quality, i um, not going to cover that too much, but I am going to move us on. Um, coordination with housing and healthcare, leverage housing resources. I kind of just gave that away with my little source feel there. Um, leveraging those healthcare resources, right? Um, SOAR would be an opportunity for you all to maximize your points in this area around coordination with housing and healthcare. I might have said that wrong. Yeah. All right, next up, COC merger. These don't seem to be very popular. This has been very static um, through and through my NOFO experience, which goes back to like 26, 2015, 2016. Um, there are bonus points for COCs that merge. Um, there are bonus points for COCs that merge that had lower scores on pre prior uh, year COC program competition. Um, and then there are additional points if, you know, the point in time counts were affected by changes in the methodology that resulted from a merger uh, in a way that would affect a COC score. So for those communities that are thinking about merging, um, there could potentially be an opportunity for bonus points. Do's and don'ts. Not gonna read this verbatim, but what I am gonna tell you is that the Alliance has a system series. Um, and within that system series, we've got a ton of additional resources available for you. There's a whole there's a blog, there's resources, there's do's and don'ts. 
Um, if I had to highlight one do, uh, it's going to be the do read the NOFO to ensure you fully understand the changes this year. Um, if I had to name one of the don'ts, um, don't panic. We're here to help. Uh, you can reach out. We can't write your application for you, but we can uh, answer as many of the questions as we see. And I am going to breeze through these last two slides so that we can get some of those Q&As answered over the last 15 minutes. Um, we've got resources broken down around promoting racial equity and reducing disparities. Um, if you had to pick one to read, I, I'm going to suggest moving beyond the equity plateau, opportunities to advance equity in the homeless response system. Really great study from our uh, colleagues at uh, the organization formerly known as NIS. Uh, talks about power sharing, um, talks about moving past just disaggregating your data uh, and how not to get stuck in that analysis paralysis. Also engaging individuals with lived experience and expertise, a ton of resources, including one by my uh, girl, Takesha Jordan, who's actually on the call today. Check out that YouTube. It's a quick 30 minutes. Um, a number of fellow TA providers and consultants in the space that put that together who also happen to have lived experience. Uh, experience and expertise. Uh, additional resources, do your housing first assessment. Uh, there's both the assessment and an assessment tool, um, a checklist, and last but not least, system performance. There's a lot of information here around system performance. These slides will be made available to you. I'm going to get us to our last slide uh, with two gentle reminders. If you have tech support questions, uh, concerning the NOFO or eSNAPS. eSNAPS is where you submit your NOFO application. You must send those to HUD. Please do not send those to the Alliance because we are not HUD. Uh, email address is there. Also, um, preemptively in this NOFO, uh, there's a note that says in the event of a major disaster uh, subject to a Stafford Act declaration, which only the president can make uh, if that happens during the competition as a result of a major catastrophic disaster. Uh, you must send written notification to cocdisaster at hud.gov. And I'm going to pause now and ask all my peeps to come back on camera so that we can tackle some of these Q&A questions live. All right. And I'm going to stop. I'm going to stop sharing for just a second so we can actually see one another. Okay. Marcy, are there any specific Q&A questions that you want to tackle? Dun, dun, dun. Um, let me, uh, I did not know we were going to do this. So this is like live television, y'all. That's what we're doing right now. All good. I'll kick us. I'll kick us off. Uh, will we get slides and recording? Yes, you will. We answer that one live. So for everyone um, who might have missed this at the beginning, you will get slides. You will also get a recording. Our comms team has committed to sending this information out and getting it posted uh, by tomorrow morning. Um, we're on East Coast time. So if you're on the West Coast and you get up early, don't know if it'll be up just yet. Um, we answered this question live. All right, here's a good question that we can kind of popcorn around. Uh, do you have any recommendations for how a COC can work with uh, BIPOC grassroots organizations that aren't interested in working with us unless we take a hardline stance against our local housing authority, who to these grassroots groups are viewed as generational community oppressor and slumlord without severing? Ooh, that's a deep question, y'all. Um, but a really great question question. I think you have to start small, right? Like, let's live in a place of truth. There have been historical harms that have been caused to certain groups over and over and over again in our country, some that are still being perpetuated today. We can both hold true to the grassroots organization um, experience, trauma triggering, and try to bridge or broker a partnership. Um, I think my advice to you is just to continue to listen and to take cues from them. Uh, it's really important to maintain that relationship with the PHA because at the end of the day, it's a resource for people experiencing homelessness. And I hope that grassroots organizations um, will be able to process some of 
what they've experienced and turn a new uh, turn a new page, turn over a new leaf when they're ready. Josh, feel free to add on. I saw you typing. Ooh, do you have any resources related to getting a housing authority started? Our rural area does not currently have one, but we are looking into creating one, supporting our community to create one. I'm going to kick that over to Marcy, who used to work at HUD and may have some insight because this chica does not. I, I believe, I think we put some uh, guidance in the chat uh, and a couple of folks weighed in. I, I would definitely just recommend starting by reaching out to your uh, local field office uh, and also talking if you're in a uh, county, talking to your uh, county commissioners or local county government. Uh, to discuss what what options are available. Um, and then, Marcy, another question for you. A lot of questions coming up about the 25% match. I know with ESGCV, we saw, you know, the suspension and waiver around that. Um, you, you care to weigh in about the conversation around waiving or discontinuing the match conversation? I certainly cannot. I, I do not have a crystal ball, so certainly can't speak to uh, to what the future holds. I, I will note that in the NOFO, the only exception uh, to the 25% match appears to be for YHDP renewal and replacement grants if they have demonstrated uh, that they are leveraging uh, different resources. Uh, so I, I think you should submit this to HUD to confirm, but I would assume unless it is explicitly excluded in the NOFO, that 25% match that's required within the COC interim rule applies to all other projects. Okay. Okay, I got a question for you. Do you think that the housing first approach is a one size fits all and works for everyone? So I'm going to answer the second part first, and that is absolutely it works for everyone. And the reason it works for everyone is that it is not a one size fits all. Housing first is very specific that it's it doesn't matter who you are, what barriers you have. When somebody is in housing and we start with housing, then creating and figuring out what services they need, bringing those services in. Um, and it makes, and everything that happens is unique to that individual. And so it is absolutely, everyone should be housed in, as soon as we can find any unit for them without any um, predictions, any assessments, housing comes first. Um, so Maslow's hierarchy of need, right? Until you can do anything in your life, you got to have to be able to eat and have stable housing, right? That's the, that's the, bottom line and then all of that other stuff so people you know people can't work on their mental health issues because when you're living in trauma and you're homeless and I don't care if you're in a shelter it's still trauma right um it is super important that we get people into stable housing first and then work on all those things so it is absolutely for everyone um and the reason it is for everyone is it is not first of all it's not housing only the service piece has to be there. It's it's specific to what client needs are and driven by what client needs are. And Marcy just jumped in there because the way she put her hand up was like, I am going to speak on this one. Uh, yeah, I, I without going uh, without getting on my soapbox, uh, just to build off of what Kay just said, I you know I think there is a lot of uh, narrative around, uh, out there that that questions the success of Housing First. I think all of you uh, who have worked with clients at the client level uh, understand that when you have the housing uh, and the right uh, service resources available that are accessible to people when they want them based on what their uh, choices are, Housing First is successful. At a national level or at a community level, bringing it to scale can be uh, it is where we run into a problem because there isn't enough housing, there aren't enough service resources that are, are meeting the needs of what people want and what people choose. So I think uh, we just need to continue to advocate for those resources and making sure that as a system, we are creating uh, housing and service resources that actually meet the needs and wants and choices of the people that we're serving. 
uh, in order to, to bring housing first uh, to scale. Thank you very much. <laughs> well, and let me just throw one more thing out there. I think, again, I want you guys to have robust conversations in your community about like what is housing. That does not mean that everybody is going to be successful in their own apartment, living by themselves, you know, paying the rent on a regular basis. You know, it it and and so at the conference we you know have several workshops on you know being really creative around what housing can look like for folks. So so um, for what Marcy said, it's looking at all kinds of housing resources. PSH you know, can be, you know, and not just, you know, uh, I mean, PSH funded with HUD dollars and other funding can be all kinds of things from um, sharing housing, having roommates um, in single room occupancy options, um, like renting rooms from somebody that they may know or may not know. And so, so, that's where we have to start having robust discussions about what well, we're using this term housing. I think sometimes people get hung up on like, oh, if you're what single, kind you is. this yeah. kind of housing, if you're a family, you need this. And it, it's the options that people choose, right? But it, it's a place that they can stay for an undetermined length of time um, and, it, and it's permanent for them. Thanks for that, Marcy and Kay. So I'm actually gonna take this next question. Um, and statement, homelessness is a housing problem. That being said, is there a NOFO or other funding source that will be providing funding for affordable housing for everyone? Um, I think my response to that is there are a variety of different funding sources that you can braid together um, within your community. For example, with the American Rescue Plan, we saw the introduction of home ARP funding, um, which is really targeted towards people at risk of or currently experiencing homelessness. Uh, and some of those eligible activities include not only tenant-based uh, rental assistance, but supportive services, uh, and also production or preservation of affordable housing. Additionally, you have community development block grant funding, which has a variety of eligible expenses. Um, if there are any community action agencies who are our uh, our go-to uh, CSBG or Community Services Block Grant Funding. There's an array of eligible activities around there. Also, look into your state uh, state housing trust fund. I know the state of Oregon just hit 25,000 units of uh, affordable housing created. They've been working pretty diligently. Woo woo to Emma, community action. Um, they've been working really diligently on a strategic plan to ramp up their production because Homelessness is definitely a housing problem and not just an affordable housing, but a low income housing. Many folks that are uh, extremely uh, low income or very low income just don't have the resources to be able to afford even a, a one bedroom apartment. Um, great question uh, from that anonymous. Yes, LIHTC, State Housing Trust Fund, Local Housing Trust Fund. Um, I think if I had to wrap up in answering that, is there are options out there? Unfortunately, they're kind of siloed options. See if you can be the change in your community to bring all the options to the table and really advocate for um, making those resources available through braided funding. I agree, Antoinette. We should not have to be experts in braiding funding. There's a great resource from USICH that talks about the different funding sources um, that might be helpful so that you have to bear less of the burden. And I think Marcy's going to look for that one. I can look for that one, but I would also, I just also would encourage us to continue to push for our. Uh, you know, federal partners to implement the strategies that are included within All In, which is the federal strategic plan, uh, which covers things like making things like utilizing different funding streams uh, easier on uh, you and within the community so that it doesn't have to be so complicated. Uh, and I can find that resource right now. And we have two minutes and 11 questions. So we apologize if we're not able to answer every question live. Um, I da, 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 would like to, this is a great one to end on. Um, someone who's anonymous would like to hear our opinion about going from completing a NOFO every year, um, and, but in, from moving to completing a NOFO every year to every other year. Marcy, you want to take that? Yes, one? sure. That's in our ask. Uh, that's one of our policy priorities for this year. I, I earlier included a link to a take action 
letter that you can modify to uh, send to your uh, specific representative, and that uh, that language is included in there. Uh, the Senate THUD, uh, which is the uh, HUD's Appropriations Committee, included the language that would allow that specifically. Uh, so that is super exciting. Um, so so speak up, speak out, uh, and don't let the moment pass. All right, folks. I again, we answered forty nine out of fifty nine questions. Um, so apologies for those ones we were not able to answer. Um, we've enjoyed our time today. We hope that you all have found this somewhat helpful. Um, reach out to HUD with any questions. And other than that, we thank y'all for participating today. Best of luck on your NOFO. You got this. We're rooting for y'all. Lived experience, promoting equity, integration. Knock it out the park with your system performance and you'll do great. Happy Thursday.